Hello everyone, my name is Pramod Senaratiapa. It's like promote, but with a D at the end. And I am doing my PhD at the University of Alberta, working towards becoming a theoretical physicist. Now you may have heard of at least a couple of theoretical physicists, Albert Einstein, Stephen Hawking, and if you've ever done kind of a deep dive into Wikipedia on theoretical physicists, you may have even heard of my favorite, one of my favorite theoretical physicists, Emmy Noether. Now, Emmy Noether was, um, she was a German mathematical physicist who discovered a very, very important theorem that a lot of physicists that even I use to this day in our research. Now, this is even though Emmy Nerda discovered this theorem more than a hundred years ago. Now, modern physics is um, very different from what it looked like a hundred years ago, but it can, can be kind of classified by the extreme stuff in nature that the physicist studies. So all of the physicists that you may have heard about um, and all those names that I just mentioned uh, and you know the Albert Einstein, Stephen Hawking, can be grouped into two kinds of physicists. One being particle physicists and the other being astrophysicists. Um, so what is this extreme thing that these physicists study? Well, particle physicists you can think about as scientists who study extremely small things. Um, we know that everything around us, uh, everything that you see, you, me, are we were made out of atoms and particle physicists like to think okay what further thing can we break those down into and it turns out atoms are made out of electrons and protons and neutrons and particle physicists weren't satisfied there they wanted to know what those are made out of and um, that is kind of the level where particle physicists are at now they've understood that there are these things called quarks that live inside protons and neutrons and probing deeper into these quarks themselves are what a lot of those physicists are doing. So the, the why this is important is because the laws of physics that you know govern everything that we do is very different from the laws of physics at these really tiny scales. It's a new kind of theory that you need to understand quarks and protons and neutrons. This is called quantum mechanics and particle physics are trying to understand the quantum mechanics of really, really small things. So that's what they study, extremely small matter. On the other end of the scale are astrophysicists. They actually study stuff that's really, really large. Why this is interesting is because a thing being really large actually means it also has a large amount of gravity. So extreme gravity is what uh, astrophysicists like to study, black holes, galaxies, these are all a consequence of extreme amounts of gravity. And this leads to a lot of interesting behavior, a lot of weird properties that you don't get around us in our normal gravitational environment. So one, one really funny aspect of extreme gravity environments is say you're falling into a black hole feet first. Um, the gravity is so extreme around a black hole that the amount of gravity, the force of gravity that's pulling on your legs would be much greater than the force of gravity that would be pulling on your head. So as you fall into a black hole, you would be stretched out by the force of gravity like a noodle into a really thin shape. And the actual name for this process, the technical term for this is spaghettification, the actual term. So. That's the two kind of physicists that you may have heard about. Particle physicists studying extremely small things, astrophysicists studying extreme gravity. Now, I am neither of those. Um, the field I'm in is actually called condensed matter physics, and it's not as well known of a field, although we study stuff that's extremely fascinating as well. Now, the we're not studying the smallest things in the world. We're not studying the largest gravitational objects in the world. The extreme that we like to study is extreme temperature. So the matter that I study is at the, not only the coldest temperatures on earth, 
but actually the coldest temperatures in the entire universe. Now, um, this is, this is, you may have heard the name for this, it's called absolute zero. And in the scale that we use, um, this is negative 273 degrees Celsius. Now I'm in Edmonton, it's pretty cold here. It goes to about negative 30 degrees in the winter at, at its uh, coldest, but that's still almost 240 degrees warmer than what I study. Now the coldest temperature on earth was in Antarctica. It went to minus 90 degrees Celsius, still warmer by about 180 degrees than what I study. And why I say it's also the coldest temperature in the entire universe is because particle physicists and astrophysicists have studied um, the deepest reaches of space and found out that the coldest regions of space are all actually at about negative 270 degrees. And that's still a couple of degrees warmer than what I like to study. So the coldest regions of space in the entire universe are located at a few labs on Earth. Um, one of them happens to be at, um, or a few of the spaces, turns out to be at the University of Alberta. There are quite a few experiments there in um, the science building, the physics building, that has some of the coldest matter in the universe at less than minus 272 degrees Celsius. Um, so you may think that matter being very cold wouldn't be that interesting because you are gonna get stuff that's just frozen solid. Why is that interesting? Well, it's interesting because um, it's not actually true that everything's frozen solid at absolute zero. Um, this is something that you will, <laughs> that you may have been taught at school that there are, um, you know, three or four states of matter and those are, that's it. There are no more things. But that actually turns out to be a general rule that there are exceptions to. Uh, this is actually something that you'll see as you learn more and more about a subject. You learn some general principles um, in your classes and then you get to a higher level and you find out those aren't actually true. There are exceptions to that rule. And those exceptions are what scientists love to study. So getting into specifics of my field. So it's not four states of matter. It's not just solid, like with gas and maybe plasma, maybe, maybe that's something that you've heard about, but solid liquid gas are three of the states of matter that are usually taught in schools. Well, it turns out that is just a consequence of us being human. We as people only live in a very narrow temperature range. We, you know, inhabit places on the earth that are minus 50 degrees Celsius to about 50 degrees, positive 50 degrees Celsius. And pressure too. We can't handle a really high pressure environment. We can't handle really low air pressure environments either. And those four states of matter are what we encounter when it's like these normal temperatures, these normal pressures. But if we, if we suddenly had access to really high temperatures or really low temperatures or really high pressures, or really low pressures, there are actually a lot more states of matter. Um, in fact, we don't really know how many states of matter there actually are. We, we can't count. There are so many. So low temperatures is interesting because it lets quantum mechanics, what I was talking about with particle physics, um, form new states of matter. So quantum mechanics at low temperatures form these amazing new states of matter that have really, really strange properties. So one thing that I actually um, studied for my master's is a, a state of matter called a superconductor. So a superconductor is something that conducts electricity without any resistance. Normal metals around us like copper that are in power lines that bring electricity from power generation stations to your house are, um, they, they conduct electricity, but they have resistance to them. So that means that the electricity that's coming from the power station to your house, actually five to 15% of that electricity is lost as heat on the way to your house. Now, if you had something that had zero resistance, you could get all the electricity 
without any loss of energy along the way. So having a superconductor instead of normal, let's say copper wires would be super useful um, to, to tr transmit electricity all around the world. Unfortunately, it turns out superconductors, um, as far as we know right now, only occur at really, really low temperatures. And then if you're trying to cool down all the wires in your house, you would lose more energy um, in the cooling process than you would save in having no resistance in your wires. Now, this is not um, forbidden by quantum mechanics to occur at higher temperatures. And actually, it's an open question in physics right now is whether you can make a room temperature superconductor. Can you make a material that conducts electricity without any loss, without any resistance um, at normal room temperatures? Um, people have been trying to find a material like that for decades now. So still an active area of research and maybe, hey, maybe if you become a physicist one day, this would still be a problem that you could solve by the time you get to your PhDs or become a professor. Now, superconductors are also really cool, not just because they conduct electricity, but because of how they interact with magnetic fields. Now, magnets that we know of are have like two states. You can think about them as repelling each other or attracting each other. Superconductors interact with magnetic fields, but in a really interesting way. So the magnetic field lines that come from magnets, it's like superconductors can, can feel them, can touch them. And instead of just attracting or repelling, these invisible field lines become like ropes that a superconductor can hold on to. And so if you put a superconductor on top of a magnet, the superconductor actually will float in a, in a process called magnetic levitation. It's because they're holding on to the invisible field lines given off by a magnet. So this is a, one of my favorite demos to do when I talk about physics is to show a superconductor when you cool it down to a certain temperature, it suddenly lifts off um, the surface and starts levitating. And this is um, a consequence of quantum mechanics. Now, superconductors have also found application over the last couple of years in a thing called a quantum computer. This is what I actually did for my master's. Um, I, I was at the University of Victoria and um, I was working in collaboration with a quantum computing company to build a new type of computer. Now, superconductors can be used to make a new computer called a quantum computer that can solve problems way faster than any normal computer that we have or any supercomputer in the world. Google actually recently made a prototype quantum computer using superconductors and found out that they could solve a problem in just a couple of minutes using their quantum computer that would have taken somewhere around 10,000 years using the biggest supercomputer on earth that we know. So superconductors could be used to bring about a new age of computation. And you can think about all the amazing, you know, computations, all the new technology that we could produce if we had um, a quantum computer <laughs> in every home. Um, so this is an active area of research that condensed matter physicists do, it's trying to figure out how can we use the amazing properties of superconductors to produce new and amazing technology. But in the last few years, in my, in my PhD, I've moved away from superconductors and figuring out how to use them in technology to make new computers to exploring a new type of matter, a new type of quantum matter called a superfluid. Now, superfluids are actually fairly similar to a superconductor, but as the name suggests, it's actually a liquid, not a, not a solid object. So superfluids, you can think about uh, by thinking about normal liquids that are around us. Um, physicists like to think about liquids in terms of something called viscosity. Viscosity is just how thick that liquid is. So water, like this, is not a very viscous substance. It flows pretty easily. Oil um, is a little more viscous than that, a little more thick than that, and it flows less readily. And honey, you can think of as a really viscous substance. 
it, it doesn't flow very easily. And how does viscosity change with temperature? Well, if you've ever you know, tried to fry something on the, on the stove, if you've tried to um, heat up some honey, you'll notice that things like water and oil and honey become less viscous as you heat it up. And as you cool it down, it becomes more and more viscous, more and more thick. So if I ask, how can we make a zero viscosity substance? The first thought you may have is we heat it up. We take that liquid and then we heat it up and it'll become zero viscosity at some point. Unfortunately, that doesn't really work. Um, it turns into a gas and this gas never actually turns into a zero viscosity substance. Even the air around us has some sort of thickness to it. You can feel it uh, as wind. This is how thick the air is. Um, the answer actually turns out to be if you want to have a liquid that flows without viscosity, it has no friction in it, you have to go the opposite way. You have to cool it down, which seems counterintuitive. And my favorite example of a superfluid and my favorite element of all time is helium. So helium, the gas that you see um, in balloons and you can inhale and get your voice really squeaky. This gas, actually, if you, if you cool it down, you cool it down and you cool it down, if you get it down to right about negative 268 degrees, it goes from being a gas to a liquid. Now, it's just a normal liquid at that point. It actually has the same viscosity as like olive oil. So it's as thick as olive oil when you get down to negative 268 degrees. Now you can cool it down a little bit more, uh, just a little bit more, and it'll get a little thicker, a little thicker, until it reaches right about negative 271 degrees, where like magic, like a switch being flicked on, it turns from olive oil to a zero viscosity substance. So helium at negative 272 degrees is a superfluid. That means it can flow without any friction. And the way to think about that is if I have a cup like this, um, so this is just full of normal water. I can take a spoon, I can give it a swirl. And I can create this little whirlpool in there. And after just a few seconds, you'll see this whirlpool die down. It actually stops and becomes normal flat liquid without a whirlpool in the center. Now imagine you have a cup of superfluid helium and like I did earlier, you take the spoon and you give it a swirl. It will also create a whirlpool in its center. But unlike this water, you could wait a few minutes and the whirlpool will still be going. You could wait 10 minutes, there'll still be a whirlpool. You could wait an hour, there'll still be a whirlpool. You could wait a century, there'll still be a whirlpool. Zero friction, zero viscosity um, substances like superfluid helium have no friction that stops them from ever, um, well, turning from a whirlpool back into a normal flat liquid again. So properties like that is what I study. What kind of new behavior can you get in matter when you cool things down to unearthly temperatures like negative 272 degrees? So I study superfluid helium and um, this can also be used in applications like quantum computing. There are companies out there who are trying to do just that. Uh, but I'm more interested in, okay, what is the quantum mechanical reason that it has these amazing properties? And can we figure out more amazing properties, maybe make some new states of matter by understanding the mathematics that lies in superfluids, in superconductors? So that's what I do every day as a condensed matter theoretical physicist. So what is a typical day in the life of a theoretical physicist? Now this question makes me think of an article about one of my other favorite theoretical physicists, um, a physicist named Julian Schwinger, who was very famous as a particle physicist back in the 1950s. And there was a newspaper doing an article about him. And there's a picture that they used to feature him and of him holding a cup and a pen. And the caption for that says, his laboratory is his ballpoint pen. So it's interesting 
being in the life of a theoretical physicist because you can do that work everywhere. Um, all you need really is something to write on and increasingly more in nowadays your my computer to do some calculations on. So let me actually take you to my workstation at home right now because of um, the restrictions, but you can see what a typical day looks like by looking at my setup over there. So welcome to my home office where I spend most of my day trying to understand the mathematics of superconductors, of superfluids, and of quantum mechanics in general. Now, having a blackboard is actually a very important cultural part of being a physicist because this is how back in the day physicists used to solve problems. They would write down equations on their blackboards and try and understand what that mathematics was trying to tell them. Now, this is still an important part of my day, but um, equations can become too hard to solve by hand, so we have to use other methods to do them. So that's another part of my job. One part that's very important and um, maybe not stress that much in physics is how important working with other people, working with people in the community is. So I spend a lot of my day trying to read papers, trying to understand what problems people in the physics community, in the condensed matter physics community, think is important and try and understand what I can do to solve those problems. So I spend a lot of my day reading these papers, reading textbooks, trying to understand the, the open problems that I can make some progress on. Now, um, like I said, equations can get too hard to solve by hand by just writing them down on a blackboard. So a lot of my day is actually also spent trying to think of computer programs to that can solve equations that I can't. So learning how to program has been a very important part of my life uh, because equations that we encounter as physicists nowadays are extraordinarily complex and using the, the computational power of, of supercomputers uh, and sometimes quantum computers is a very important part to understand how nature works. The mathematics of nature can be understood both by writing them down on blackboards and also by solving them on the computers. So that's how I spend my day. I sit here, I talk to people, I write down some equations, I read some papers, and through this process of collaboration, um, especially with experimental physicists at the University of Alberta, um, we try and come up with new problems, some new answers, and um, solve some outstanding problems in low temperature physics. So my educational background was very much shaped by the ambitions I had in high school. So as a high school student, I knew I wanted to be a scientist, but whether I was gonna be a biologist or a physicist was the decision I was making. And the choice was made in grade 12 when I discovered that grade 12 biology involved dissecting a frog. So I said, nope, and decided I would become a physicist instead. So I applied to Carleton University in Ottawa in their honors physics program. And they actually had a theory specialization because I knew I wanted to be a theoretical physicist. And Carleton was amazing. I got to meet an amazing community there. I was part of the physics society and managed to uh, organize a trip to a underground physics lab, particle physics lab called Snow Lab in Sudbury, Ontario, which was one of the highlights of my time at Carleton. Um, Sudbury, Ontario Snow Lab is this physics lab that's located a couple of kilometers underground in an old nickel mine where they do fundamental physics research. So uh, seeing these laboratories was an amazing experience. Another really important part of my education there was the co-op program um, at Carleton, which let me take one and a half years off after my third year to work at different physics labs all over Canada. So, eight, so for eight months after my third year of university, I worked at Atomic Energy of Canada Limited, which is a nuclear physics lab located um, a couple of hours north of Ottawa in Chalk River, where they did research into nuclear reactors. So I actually had an office 
right next to a nuclear reactor and I spent eight months there doing research in nuclear physics. Right after that ended, I went and flew to Vancouver to a particle physics lab located on the University of British Columbia grounds called Triumph. So they do fundamental particle physics research where they try and figure out what matter does at the smallest scales. So Triumph has this amazing machine, which is a particle accelerator that uses huge magnetic fields to accelerate particles to almost the speed of light and they would collide it with other things, other particles, and these collisions, they would study it to figure out, okay, what are the smallest parts of matter that come out of that collision? So this massive particle accelerating machine generates magnetic fields so large that you could stand on top of the machine and hold a paperclip on your hand, and the paperclip would stand upright to align itself with the magnetic field that was coming out of this massive machine. So these experiences um, at Snow Lab, at AECL, the nuclear physics lab, at Triumph, the particle physics lab, were very fundamental to my education um, in terms of I had an amazing time there doing research, but I also figured out that they weren't the kind of physics I wanted to do. I didn't want to do nuclear physics. I didn't want to do particle physics. And that's how I ended up doing condensed matter physics for my master's at the University of Victoria in Vancouver Island. So I spent two and a half years there working in collaboration with a quantum computing company in Vancouver called D-Wave. So D-Wave tries to make commercial quantum computers to sell to people. So for two and a half years, I would collaborate with the experimental physicists there and look at fundamental aspects of superconductors to make these amazing new technologies. So I had an amazing time there, uh, finished my master's, and um, then moved to the University of Alberta, where I started doing research in superfluids. And so I've spent the last two and a half years here collaborating with other physicists here and having an amazing time uncovering what happens at the lowest temperatures. So I'll be here for a couple more years, finishing up my PhD, and then hopefully move forward in academia and become a postdoc um, and maybe even a professor in the future. So I love almost every aspect of my job, but three things that are very important to me as part of my job are the freedoms that being a physicist gives me, the community that I'm surrounded with, and the science communication work I do. So. The freedom aspect is that I get to decide how I want to spend my day. Solving a research problem isn't um, a step-by-step -step process where you can work nine to five, um, where you know what the next step is. I sometimes have to just spend hours talking to people. Sometimes I just spend my day reading papers or working on my computer, coding something. So. It's up to me how I want to tackle these research problems and the freedom that comes with it um, is, is a very important part of the job. And there's also the freedom of being a theoretical physicist. I'm not expected to be in a lab. I can work on these problems anywhere I want. So I have done you know, my research for the last nine months, 10 months right here in my house. I've done research in the past on a moving bus. I've done research on vacation. So the, the freedom to do research in, in any environment I want is a wonderful, wonderful part of my job. The community aspect is something that's probably not uh, thought of in the physics community, um, but physics isn't a lone pursuit. You aren't doing all of the aspects of, of, of finding out new theories of nature by yourself, you are talking to a lot of people. So having a community of people who love the same things I do, doing science um, is an amazing part of my job. I get to talk to world experts in, in all these different fields. And um, it's very gratifying to know people who are at the top of their field. And the final piece that I really, really enjoy is science communication, doing stuff like this, where I get to talk to people about science and translate research that's very cutting edge and tell people about it and tell people why 
everything uh, about physics nowadays is so exciting. So a few examples of that is um, in Victoria, when I was doing my master's, I managed to get a group of my friends together and enter a competition called Dancer PhD. So Dancer PhD um, challenges scientists to express their science, their whatever they're doing research on, through the medium of dance. So I got all of my friends, about 20 of them, in the swing dancing community, and I wrote a mini musical um, about electrons and superconductors and how electrons behave inside a superconductor using swing dancing and using my friends um, as examples to, to pretend like they're electrons moving in a metal. So I wrote this 10 minute musical, I wrote the music for it and um, wrote the choreography for the dance for it and submitted it to this competition. And in 2018, I found out I won this competition. Um, you can watch this video. It's called Superconductivity, the musical online. And um, it you know, got a lot of attention all around the world. So having done this research, but then also being able to communicate it to the public was such a joy. Um, knowing so many people knew the importance of superconductors and how they relate to quantum computers was a, a very amazing experience. Um, I've also had the opportunity to do a whole bunch of talks. Um, I've given a TEDx talk. I've managed to um, you know, collaborate with a lot of artists uh, over the last few years, trying to figure out fun new ways to communicate science and communicate physics and the love of physics to people who generally don't think of physics and, and maybe music or art as things that go together. So these are some of the things that have really brought, brought me joy, not only doing the physics, but explaining physics to other audiences in new ways. My advice for anyone who is thinking about a career in STEM, thinking about becoming a scientist or maybe even a physicist, is to find your community. And this is something you can do at any stage of your career, whether you're in high school or you're in your PhD like me, finding people who have the same interests as you, uh, interest in science as you, interest in the same topics as you, is very, very important. Now, maybe this is not possible in times of um, having to stay at home, but finding an online community is, is amazingly easy these days. So say you're interested in physics, there are communities on whatever, social media you want to try, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube. Um, there are groups of people who enjoy talking about science, who enjoy thinking about science in different ways. So joining those communities, talking with people who are not in your same age group um, is super important. So talk to people, figure out how people do their science, and um, it will make the process much easier. Science you know, it takes a long time sometimes to be a scientist and maybe your motivation will wane at some point. Science is very hard. So finding people who are supportive and who can get you through those times is a very, very important part of science. So that's what I would encourage you to do. Find a community of supportive people who will, who will support you through your process of finding your science. On a more practical level, learning how to program is now important for whatever you want to do. So becoming a scientist is not just about, of course, writing down equations or going outside and looking at nature. It's also about collecting data and figuring out how to process all that. So learning how to become a computer programmer is important regardless of what kind of science you want to do. So learn how to program from a very young age and you will be set so well for a career in science. So that's my advice on a more practical level.